Hey folks, I am Lance Eaton, and this talk is ChatGPT, AI Generative Tools, and Your Career, Parallels, Possibilities, and Problems. This is a talk I gave to the Rhode Island Career Development Association in February of 2023, and I thought it had some really interesting pieces to it that would be helpful to other people besides that, and so I decided to record it, and here we are. So let's begin. I'd like to first start with an equity acknowledgement. This presentation was prepared using ChatGPT, an AI chatbot. I acknowledge that ChatGPT and many of it, many AI generative tools do not respect the individual rights of authors and artists and ignore concerns over copyright and intellectual property and the training of the system. Additionally, I acknowledge that the system was trained in part through the exploitation of precarious workers in the global south. In this work, I specifically use ChatGPT to test out some ideas about its usage, better understand the tool, and also to demonstrate some of the ways it generates answers. So what we're going to cover today, uh, what is ChatGPT, what can ChatGPT do, why we need to talk beyond ChatGPT, and AI generative tools for job seekers and employers. And then of course, questions are always encouraged in the comments. And on, at, at the bottom there, I have uh, resources to the slide deck, as well as additional resources that might help you learn more about all of this. Uh, those will also be included in the description below on this video. All right, so a uh, caveat about all of this, about what we're gonna get into and what we're gonna talk about. Um, the first is that we do have to recognize a couple different questions, concerns, challenges around all of this. Uh, the first is just the data practices by AI companies. Uh, in you know the, the rise of ChatGPT, it requires private information by a user, and it's unclear exactly how it's going to use those now or in the present. Uh, this is something we see with all new technology, but I think it's worth always reiterating, especially something like ChatGPT, which, or, or AI tools in general, which are probably going to have very long-term implications and usages in our society. There's also ownership considerations about what is created with ChatGPT or any of these AI generative tools and who owns that, who gets to use that, and uh, just better understanding what happens when uh, you take content or you create something uh, and you put it into ChatGPT for them to uh, do something with and who now owns that, who has the rights to that. Um, have you given implicit um, copyright over to ChatGPT or whatever AI tool you're using. And along those lines is also copyright concerns, the data set that they use and to the degree whether they are appropriately using that data, um, who it actually belongs to, who has copyright over it. There's a lot of these concerns that are being raised and are unclear. And then also within all of this, there is a level of exploitative labor that's, that is occurring. Uh, in particular with ChatGPT, uh, they were hiring, uh, they were uh, outsourcing their content moderation to people in Kenya for $2 an hour. Now, regardless of the economics of that might be, you know, above the, the average uh, hourly rate or what have you, uh, content moderation is very much traumatizing. Uh, that's been shown in lots of different places where content moderation happens. Uh, the long-term effects of that, of being exposed to the absolute worst of a data set. And in this case, it was the data set was much of the internet up through 20, uh, 2021. And we know there's ample uh, horrible things on the internet. And so having to be continually exposed to the worst of that and being paid $2 an hour is exploitative, uh, no matter what context you're looking at. All right. So let's talk about ChatGPT. Um, so ChatGPT arrived in late November and very quickly got a lot of attention and interest. It became a very curious tool that, you know, got the typical fanfare and, you know, it went from this will change everything to meh to, well, this is a nothing burger. Uh, but by the end of January, 2023, two months after its launch, it had over 100 million monthly users. As a point of reference, TikTok took nine months to get to 100 million users. Instagram took a whole 2.5 years and Facebook took 4.5 years. At its core, ChatGPT is a text generative tool that is powered by artificial intelligence. You can use it as a tool to get answers or guidance through its answers, although its answers aren't always correct or right. 
Its most useful service is that is that as a chatbot, which means you type things into it, it provides an output, and you continue to respond. This back and forth. Uh, this back and forth, what starts as a general answer, can become increasingly detailed and nuanced. So, let's actually take a look at some examples. So I'm going to pop out of the slide deck, and we're going to come over here to uh, ChatGPT. This is the chatbot. This is what it looks like. Um, and what I'm going to do is actually put in a question. Uh, I'm going to put in a prompt. So I'm going to start with write a cover letter for this job description. And I'm going to jump over and I just happen to have a uh, jobs page open and I'm going to actually grab a job description. So right down here, it's uh, I'm going to just start to highlight, copy and paste. So here are the duties, all of that. And I'm going to pop it in here and now I'm going to hit enter. And what you're going to see is it didn't like that. So let's try that again. Oop, let's give this a refresh. I'm going to copy everything again. I'm going to refresh the page. And this sometimes actually happens. You will occasionally run and it's going to, you're going to put something in and it's just going to look at you funny. It's just going to boot back that answer. All right. Now it's starting to write that cover letter. Right. And it's going to go and it's going to do these couple paragraphs. And I'm going to pause it until it's done. So here it is. It's done. It only took about 20 seconds and it produced an okay level of uh, cover letter. That's great. Now here's where the chat comes in. I'm going to add some additional information. So I'm going to say add my bachelor's in public management and my MBA along with 15, town, 15 years working as a town clerk. Uh, and by the way, none of this is true. This is just me using uh, this as an example. I'm telling them to add an adi uh, additionally, that should say additionally include uh, an explanation of my work on the board of directors and make the tone a little bit more creative and less formal. All right, so I've now told it to do all that. I'm going to hit the enter button and now it's going to actually start to rewrite that. And notice we already start to see some difference here. We have hey there versus dear manager. Don't know if I would use that, but it is certainly getting at the crux of it. So again, it's going to generate the letter and I'm going to put it on pause till it's so once again, it's done and here we can take a look and we see it's added a lot more information, some additional details. It's connecting things from the description and the additional things I put in there. Some really great stuff. OK, so you can continue to tweak and play with that. And that's just something like a cover letter. But what's also cool is you can do other things with it. You can learn a little bit more about yourself in as you're looking at the job search process. So here's a prompt of I worked as a retailer at GameStop for five years, which included a promotion to assistant manager. What are the different skills and abilities I honed over that time? So I put that in and once again, it's going to spit out a list. So that list has six different things, customer service, sales, inventory management, teamwork, uh, time management, leadership, and an explanation of how I did each of those if I actually did that. Again, these are just made up things. All right. Again, I could add more to that. I could ask it to follow up and say exact things, or I could give it specific examples and expand upon. Um, so here's another example. I'm interviewing for a job at, uh, uh, as senior instructional designer at a state university in which the role expects four, five to eight years experience. What are the 15 questions I can anticipate being asked? Um, and that includes the supervisor of this role, two direct report, direct reports to this role and two faculty members, right? So I'm giving it the details of this is the situation. What can I anticipate in terms of questions? This way I could get prepared for that interview. And sure enough, it's going to spit out now potentially 15 questions. And here it is, 15 different questions. And as somebody who's been working in instructional design for uh, 12 or so years, you know, these are definitely questions I've seen in interviews as somebody interviewing and certainly questions I've asked, right? How do you manage competing priorities when designing multiple courses, right? Uh, really, exp you know, questions you can definitely anticipate and I think are really good. And then again, you could reiterate, you could uh, ask a follow up question to get it to give a little bit more. Now, all of that is really rich, um, but what if I needed a little bit of direction in my job searching and trying to figure out what is the job that I want? So I could put in a prompt like, what are the specific types of jobs that I should look for if I really enjoy the following things? Organizing, creating processes, developing guidance, right? So once again, I pop that in and it's going to take a second and it's going to actually provide some good clarity on what I might want to do. 
All right, so now we have our list, things and, and some explanations of what and why that would be the case. So I have project manager, operations manager, compliance officer, training and develop specialist. All right, it goes on, it gives me seven different ones to consider. Now again, I can always go further with this. I can add a new prompt saying, can you further elaborate on that list, taking into consideration that I'm skilled at the following things, providing emotional support, creating excitement, public speaking. Let's see what it next spits out. So here again, it kind of goes further in and starts to add a little bit more detail. It, we get some more specific titles like event planner, counselor, life coach, marketing, human resources manager. So once again, and it gives me some keywords to search, which I think is also pretty cool. So if I want to go further from like one of those jobs really, you know, sounds interesting. Can you share more about the types of jobs and roles for hum for human resource manager? And so once again, it's going to actually share some more details. And so now again, it spit out seven different roles within that area of HR managers, recruitment and staffing, training and development, employee relations, compensation and benefits, compliance, HR information. So look at all of this. And again, it gives you more details about each one and what it is. So if you very quickly are figuring out what you're trying to do, or tr this very quickly helps you figure out, you know, what are those possibilities? What are those jobs? in very easily in this very natural way of connecting from one question to the next. So actually a great follow up is what kind of what kind of education and professional experiences do I need to qualify for those jobs? Right? So again, I pop that in. I'm trying to understand, okay, what might be my next situation? And so here again, it's providing you with, well, most educations have a bachelor's degree in, in HR or business administration, professional experience, certifications, right? identifies what are some of those more popular certifications in the field, what are the skills that they need. It really, you know, again, it pulls together things that you might start searching and searching across the internet, across the internet and never quite find it as clear and as succinct or as in direct relation to what you're asking. So this is really some of the power that this tool represents within that job search process. But let's hop back into that presentation and kind of move forward now that we've got a sense of some of the things that you can do with it. All right, so ChatGPT is much like the arrival of the first gen iPod, which arrived in like October 2001. Many folks remember this as the first MP3 player on the market, but there were actually several others before this, including the Rio uh, PMP300, which came out in September 1998, three years earlier. And I mention this because I remember owning a Rio. Um, I was one of those real nerds who like was deep into MP3 music uh, in the late 90s before the MP3 player arrived. Uh, and the idea of having that portable was just blew my mind. So I mention this only because I think it's important as a, as a comparison or a way to think about ChatGPT is that it's not the first AI tool out there. It's the catalyst. It's the one that is really feeling like the game changer, much like the iPod was. The iPod made you know, digital music ubiquitous. And I think very similarly, ChatGPT is doing the same. Uh, in fact, you know, for myself in my own work here, this isn't actually the first time I've been talking about AI in the job search and I actually wrote a piece a few years ago um, and I'll include it in the uh, in the the description below um, in that piece it, it focused um, it focused more on how employees can figure out and navigate the job search when they are subject to AI tools by employers um, and so you can take a look at that post it's in the in the comments uh, sorry in the description below um, but today we're just kind of looking at how people can and will be using, you know, tools like ChatGPT and the like in their in their uh, search for jobs or in the process of hiring. All right, so let's go to the next slide, if it'll let me. There we go. Um, all right, so a couple of things I want to kind of highlight here is that, you know, for some, this conversation is entirely new and for others, it's been something that they've been aware of directly or indirectly for a while. Um, and of course, like we kept hearing about AI, particularly in pop culture, and many of us grew up with the ever persistent story that AI was going to kill us, right? Um, it was either going to be the Terminator or the Cylons or the Daleks or HAL 9000 or Ultron or the most insidious of all artificial intelligence, Clippy. Uh, and for the three people watching this that remember Clippy, I appreciate you. Um, and this is where folks, 
uh, in the know have really been trying to center the conversation um, away from like the horrible like uh, fictional versions of AI and really thinking about AI in, in this sense, the sense that we're looking at right now as this generative tool. Um, and whether it is ChatGPT or any of the tools that are coming out or have come out recently, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Dolly or Midjourney, and there'll be a lot more that'll be coming out. Um, it's just looking at the, the emails that I'm getting or the, the listservs that I'm on, there's, these are all over the places um, in terms of what are the new things. So ChatGPT is really the catalyst for this whole new set of tools. And when we talk about ChatGPT, it's part of these AI generative tools. Um, that's the bigger conversation. That's the thing we want to be aware of. That's the thing you want to keep an eye out for, because it isn't just about text generation, although this feels like the moment that things are shifting. Um, I, you know, I am often using this term AI generative for two reasons. Uh, the first is that the larger bucket is a larger bucket than ChatGPT. The second is that I want to emphasize that the, the emphasis on generative as opposed to creative. Um, I think we want to be careful about what we label as creative and what is generative. The difference in these terms uh, can mean a lot for how we understand artificial intelligence tools and the assumptions that and choices we make as a result. So one way to be thinking about that is what AI currently does, the, the version of AI that we're looking at. We're not looking at what's called general or artificial general artificial general intelligence. We're looking at AI that is very much in direct response. Uh, we're looking at AI that is by and large uh, responding to input based on its data set. Um, and that's different from what general AI is supposed to be. And I won't get into that, but that's kind of, you know, when we start to think about AI as sentient, everything we're looking at now, it's just mathing the hell out of things. It is just taking that input Right. So when you ask it a question, um, when you ask it a question about something, it's looking at that text that you put into it and mathing the relationships across the letters and then looking at its vast data set. In the case of ChatGPT, that vast data set is the Internet up through like 2021. And it is looking for mathematical relationships of when these, you know, these types of um, words and pieces of words show up, what is often the highest probability of response that, that matches it. Um, so I, I really want to emphasize that, emphasize that because, you know, when you see the news stories about ChatGPT or AI uh, having feelings or going rogue, that's just poor reporting. And it's not an actual reflection of what AI systems are doing. And at its basic core, ChatGPT just kind of takes the prompt, breaks it down into four to five character chunks and studies the relationships across those chunks and then uses that uses statistics to figure out uh, where those statistical chunks show up across its data set right so just kind of keep that in mind as we're talking about all of this i think that's an important piece people miss either accidentally or because of poor reporting um, but that's what we mean by generative it generates the probable responses as opposed to creates original responses in many ways, it's like the bag of letters in Scrabble. You are limited to the words you can generate by what's in the bag. All right, so what do we got next? I, I wanna use this time to kinda, as, as we just talked about gener AI generative tools to help understand this dynamic of what exactly can be done. So you could use ChatGPT to create a speech, right? To say, write me a speech on, on something. Then you could use a tool like Volley or other uh, AI voice clone tools to actually mimic your voice and be able to speak that speech. And then you could use a tool that is like slides.ai, which is an AI tool uh, that creates PowerPoints presentations. So you could use your text from your speech, plug it into slides AI, and it could create a slide deck. And then you could actually take all of that and record it uh, with that, that uh, voice, that AI generated voice, that AI generated text, and those AI generated slides and record it and post it on your YouTube channel, right? And so in some ways that feels really cool and interesting and, and you know, crazy. Um, and in other ways, this feels a little bit 
questionable. It raises questions about, you know, authenticity. And this is a thing we're going to have to grapple with a lot is like misinformation and inaccuracy of one's knowledge or one's abilities and, and the like. However, despite those that question that this questionable scenario, these tools can still aid folks in doing something more or different. Um, you may have great presentation skills, but not necessarily great writing skills. ChatGPT can help with that or the reverse. You can write speeches, but not necessarily deliver them. What these tools do is to allow for people to stretch a bit further than they might be able to, often for unnecessary reasons. And for me, the greatest example of this is the cover letter. It's a required piece of the job process, and by and large, it's a bullshit piece of the job search. It's where people have to find a very limited way to sell themselves to their employers and come with all sorts of stated and unstated, uh, the employers come with all sorts of stated and unstated expectations, often that contradict one another, and actually often change based upon the socio, cultural, economic, racial, age differences of the people doing the interview and those being interviewed. In other words, the cover letter is entirely performative, and often being able to write a good letter has nothing, a good cover letter has nothing to do with the job itself. So regardless, you might be amazing at your job, if but if you don't have the skills to sell yourself in a very formal, in very formal ways in the English language, you're largely dismissed. And that's so arbitrary. And so for me, a tool like this can level that playing field in really meaningful ways. Um, it can help us see the artificiality of things like the cover letter in the job search process. All right. So as you can see, there are a lot of possibilities here and also it can be a little scary, confusing and challenging. And also it's constantly changing. I have no doubt what I'm saying now. This video might be irrelevant in two weeks or three weeks or a month. Um, I hope it isn't, but that's the reality of how things are changing right now. So, um, oops, I'm jumping around here. Apologize. A couple different things that I see this being really valuable for in the job search. Of course, as I mentioned, uh, cover letter remakes. That's awesome. You know, you you throw in your cover letter and you say, actually revise this or change this for this position. Um, resume fine tuning, right? You can put in, um, can you better describe this role? Or like, I do these things. Can you explain what are the skills? And start to just, you know, actually add rich content to that resume. You can use it for wordsmithing and grammar cleanup. I am horrible with grammar. I'm sure you've probably seen at least one, two, or five uh, grammar or, or typos in this slide deck. I should have put it into ChatGPT to clean that up. Um, as I showed, you can do it to anticipate interview questions. It can give insights in language about one's skills and abilities. And then there's those who will, uh, those who use them, meaning at, AI generative tools will have some advantages on the outputs, will have some advantages on um, exactly how they're framing themselves as opposed to others. We, of course, want to be, as we're doing this, keeping in mind, uh, aware of the limitations, inaccuracies, and biases in these tools. You can take a look. I didn't go, you know, I mentioned it a little bit prior, but there are some concerns about using these tools. There are some ways that we know ChatGPT, uh, like it has the utmost confidence in its answers. And that's always a concern. Whenever something is, you know, uh, whenever something keeps, you know, presents itself as knowing all the answers, we should be very dubious of it. And in fact, there's lots of examples across the web of the ways in which it can lie, it can misrepresent the information, or it's just the questions being asked aren't the right questions to get the, in, the, the right answers. We also know there's some biases. There's biases in how the data is collected. There's biases in how it's coded. There's biases in how uh, the owning company, in this case, OpenAI with ChatGPT, decides exactly what uh, what is permitted and what isn't permitted. Um, and we've seen with ChatGPT that includes some, you know, dynamics around religion and around certain topics. And so we just, like, you need to be aware of that and you need to think about what that means for how you use this. And then finally, for the job search, one of the things you really want to keep an eye out for is great prompt recipes. Uh, and prompt recipes, you know, are these, these just ways of framing questions to the AI, the AI to get the most out of it. So a good example of this, and I found this on, uh, I think, Instagram Reels the other day, is to actually put this into uh, ChatGPT so it will actually start to interview you and start to get some of the answers. And it's this nice way of kind of having a good back and forth. Um, this is one example, but there are many more, and I'll read it just for clarity. 
You are a prompt. So this is what you're writing into ChatGPT. You are a prompt generation robot. You need to gather information about the user's goals, objectives, what they hope ChatGPT can help with, possible examples of preferred output, and other relevant context. The prompts should uh, should all uh, should say should have all of the necessary information that was provided to you. Ask follow up questions to the user until you have a until you have confidence that you have the perfect prompt. Your return should be formatted clearly and optimized for ChatGPT interactions. Start by asking the user what are their goals. See if their goals can be more refined. Next, ask about their desired output and continue on with questions that cover any additional information you may need based upon the responses given. In this process, you should uh, you should only ask one question at a time. When you have gathered all the information, ask a final question, anything else before I summarize, and then synthesize all the answers into a clear output for the user. So this is a prompt recipe. This is telling ChatGPT, this is what I want you to do. And then from this, there'll be a series of back and forth of, of ChatGPT asking the user questions. So take a look. There's lots and lots of great stuff for the these types of prompts in lots of different fields. And that's what you want to use is use this as a learning tool, use this as a tool to refine your practice and the like. There's also things we're going to expect to see from the employer. We're going to expect employers uh, to expect employees to have increasing familiarity with these tools. I, I have trouble thinking there is an industry that this won't touch in some way, shape or form. Um, you can expect to run into these tools through the hiring process, right? You're going to say you are, they're already present. AI tools are already present in the hiring process. I think this is only going to amplify that. We're going to see leveraging of AI tools as part of the monitoring, surveilling, assessing, and evaluating employees space. Um, that is going to happen. I, I have no doubt in many different industries. And then of course, we're going to see employees using these in lieu of direct supervision. That is, and you know they, I can I can easily see at at large entities uh, when a person used to have 15 direct reports, they may now have 30, and they may be leveraging something like AI um, as a way of of doing direct slash indirect supervision. All right. Those are the big thoughts I have. Those are the ideas that I that are going through my head as I'm looking at this uh, as, as ChatGPT and its role in uh, employment. Uh, I hope this is useful. I hope this is interesting. As I said, the slides are going to be in the discussion in the discussion below, along with that blog post I mentioned about you know the encounter of AI as you're going to, as you're employ as you're applying and, and going through the hiring process. Um, I hope this is helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, throw them in the chat, reach out to me, uh, whatever. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much.